Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Thank you. OK, let's go. Uh, this is a, the outline. There will be about four, five parts. Uh, these are some of the conventions used. Uh, it's pretty much uh, easy to know. But I would like to know something about you. Uh, who, when they, in their everyday writing, uses more than the letters A to Z? OK, fair amount of paper. OK, who uses other encodings than US ASCII? That's probably about the same people. OK, now another question. Who uses other encodings than UTF-8? Ah, oh, still quite a few. Yeah, still quite a few. OK. Uh, OK, this is just a little bit of an introduction about myself. I worked at uh, WCC, so that's why all my slides are in HTML, not a single line of JavaScript, and using a very old browser here. Anyway. This is mostly what I contributed to Ruby, the main parts. Uh, let's just look at this. As of yesterday, Ruby Trunk has been updated to Unicode version 9.0, uh, thanks to lots of uh, work also by Nobu. This went very smoothly. Uh, you can get the version with this RB config incantation there. And also, over the last two or three years, we have a petty, stable relationship here. Uh, Unicode is always published in, these days, in summer, a new version every year. And Ruby is usually published around Christmas every year. Uh, the versions are just uh, off by a little bit. Uh, but here are the formulas to calculate these versions, just if you want to calculate. But don't extrapolate that too far, yeah? If we go to Ruby 3.0 in 2020, then this will start to, uh, be, these formulas will start to be wrong. OK, now let's go get to the main topic of this talk, which is upcase and downcase, case conversion or case mapping. OK, uh, in Ruby 2.3, we have the following methods, upcase, downcase, capitalized, swap case. Looks all pretty good, yeah? That's OK, yeah? OK, but let's look at these here. OK, just a moment, slightly updated this. Uh, well. Are we OK with this? Actually, most of the characters there uh, are not upcased, even if it's, I say upcase, yeah? So we can revert this and conclude that in Ruby, up to Ruby 2.3, these case conversions, actually, that convert all the letters to uppercase are not available in Ruby 2.3. OK, but these are available in Trunk now and will be available in version 2.4. And this talk is mainly about uh, what, what behind the uh, background and so on. OK, uh, case conversions, there's quite a few scripts that actually have two cases. Georgian is very special. They, they uh, have a lot of. Uh, complications there and still figuring out what they want. Uh, but it's also for some minority scripts, it's kind of fashionable, you know. If you're in, in the middle of a lat using Latin and your script has only one case, then you think, well, you could actually start using uppercase, lowercase letters. And uh, so maybe we get more of these. Anyway. Uh, this is kind of historically, this uppercase, lowercase didn't exist, but it was introduced about in the 15th century uh, that this uh, it became a functional distinction. Uh, this is not a history conference, so I'm not going into the details here. Uh, 
modern case usage, this is just kind of like uh, a little reminder. It depends a bit on languages, even for, this, for one single language, like uh, uh, how do you uppercase what words in, a title of, in the title of a book or a chapter, so do you uppercase, uh, depends on, uh, even in English, depends on where you are. Uh, and at the bottom there is this famous example that we as students in Germany or Switzerland were told, you always have to make sure you uppercase and lowercase correctly, otherwise you get big misunderstandings. Okay, now, well, this is maybe a little bit outdated, but lots of people used to say, well, I ask is good enough, isn't it? Well, actually, uh, this is, most people no longer say that. But what about backwards compatibility? Can we suddenly just change this? This might be dangerous, yeah? Uh, ideally, we would actually say, okay, we use the old way, the way we always did, and then we have a new option, let's say, call on Unicode, and then we get the new stuff. But Mats felt that this wouldn't be necessary. And here, Mats is actually a great help in these situations first because he usually, he usually is right, and also, if he says something, you can kind of blame him in the very, very uh, case that he would be on. But that's extremely rare. Anyway, let's see why that's not a big issue, because first of all, lots of data is ASCII only. Lots of, lots of pieces of data that you work with in your programs. And for those that are not ASCII only, you hopefully, if you want to do uppercase or lowercase that, you want to do it right, and so you're already using a library, and now the only thing you might have to do, or be able to do, is to kick out that library. Uh, but, and this is really one of the main messages that I want to get out from this talk to everybody. Uh, check early, use a gap, go to your code base, uh, look for up, case and, and the fence and see whether there's anything that looks like it might create problems and test early. There should be a preview here of uh, Ruby 2.4 during this Ruby Kaigi coming out there. Now there's a, uh, you know there's a, we'll talk about that. Okay, now some specific problems what could happen where it really can be that you have to be careful is, well, one thing is DNS servers. DNS server is defined that it only, it does case conversion, but only for ASCII, and that's the way it's defined, and that has been like this since ages, and that won't change. Uh, and that's why we have some uh, stuff like Punicode. Uh, I don't want to show that, that looks just terrible, but anyway, uh, but, in these cases, you should already use ASCII 8 bit, actually, if you write the DNS server. So, in that case, you're already fine. And then there are other stories. I mean, these things happen, although they shouldn't happen. Uh, you allow non ASCII characters in user IDs. That looks good, yeah. Uh, if you want to be uh, kind of want to be used around the world. Then you said, oh, somebody else maybe in your company said, okay, we downcase these uh, just so that we don't have problems with accidental spelling mistakes. And then you put that into the DB, DB, database. But of course, this Cyrillic one didn't get lowercase. And then you used an exact match. And then later you update to Ruby 2.4, and suddenly the lower casing will now really work on the whole world, and it will no longer match. So if you have a kind of combination of these kinds of things, then something like that might happen. But this is a bad idea in the first place, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist, so please check. 
And then there are special cases. Uh, the most important one is the turkey coin. Okay. Now, well, if you find such a backwards compatible case, uh, you can put the ASCII option here, and then uh, it will do what it did up to Ruby 2.3. So that's what if you want to be back, if you need to be backwards compatible well, for, uh, or you have a really very special case when you need this exact behavior, which I, I hope nobody needs it, but uh, it's just there, so it's available. Okay, so then, well, to do these conversions, everybody kind of knows how to convert A to Z, uh, uppercase, lowercase. It's uh, an easy exercise for program starting programming class, even especially if you do a C class or so, find out what the characters are and so. Uh, but there's lots more characters, and for that we get the data from Unicode, they keep all that data and uh, provide it. And then there are lots, actually, there are quite a few special cases. There are uh, cases where a single character changes into more than one character. The German sharp S is such a case. The uh, ligatures are such a case. Uh, then some of these things are no longer reversible, yeah? You, up you have a lowercase character, you upcase it, you downcase it again, but you don't get back the same thing, yeah? Um, up to here, these, these things are implemented. Then the downcasing of the final Greek sigma, of the Greek sigma uh, should be, according to the Unicode standard, should be context dependent, that's not yet implemented. Uh, I hope I get around to do that. Then the next uh, special case is what's called simple case mapping. Unicode had a special case, a special specification for when you don't want the length of a string to change. And currently I say, well, in Ruby, Strings change their length all the time. We are no longer in this old world where kind of we have this uh, very strict memory restricted uh, situation. So this feels outdated and I didn't implement it, but if you need it, just say something and we can look into it. Then this turkey case, this is also implemented. You use an option here. This is very important. Uh, uppercase and lowercase, if you have a dot, you keep the dot. If you have no dot, you keep it without the dot. And there's actually stories of people getting killed because somebody kind of misread a uh, mis uh, uh, email message or so and got the wrong word because of that dot difference. So uh, this is a serious thing. Then there's another case, Lithuanian. Uh, this is less serious because it's only for accented characters and uh, the accents are not usually written. If you look at Wikipedia, Lithuanian, you don't see these accents. Uh, and also it doesn't even show on, on this font here. What Lithuanian does is that it keeps even if it puts an accent on, on a lowercase i, it keeps the dot. You just don't see it because uh, the technology is not there yet. So this is a little bit less important. Uh, and I also have to apologize, not yet implemented. Then we have another special case, something called case folding in the Unicode standard. And this is eliminating case differences. You want to just ha take two strings and say, well, if I don't think about case, are these the same or not? So in general, this is the same as down case, but 
for example, a sharp A S, which is a lowercase letter, is converted to an S S and so on. So it's it's kind of similar, like upcasing, downcasing, upcasing, downcasing, so that you get rid of these uh, various special cases. And I implemented that with a special option on downcase, this fold option here. Yeah, if you add this fold option, then this case folding is uh, done. And then there's another special case, which is title case. So for some characters, some special characters, you have three different cases, an uppercase, a lowercase, and a title case. And this thing here is a single character. Look at this. This is a single character. Yeah, these are single characters. And this is important when you capitalize, you take the first character here, but you don't take the uppercase, you take the title case version here, yeah? This one here is the correct one. And this is implemented. Uh, there are more special cases, but they get less and less important and they are not, or not yet implemented. Okay, now let's look in more detail at the implementation. Uh, you might think, well, it could be just a TR, and that would be easy, but with, the, with a TR method, it would be really long. And all these special cases, they wouldn't really work very well. So we have to be more, we have to get a bit more serious. Also, which methods do we have to implement? Actually, there uh, are 12 altogether. They are on string, they are the destructive versions, and they are this, also these versions on symbol. I didn't know before I actually went in and looked and checked and, oh, symbol has them too. What we didn't do is uh, there is one method which is called case comp. And this actually does something like sorting. It tells you whether a string is bigger or smaller than another, but with eliminating the case differences. And eliminating the case differences is not too difficult. We could somehow do that. But if you want to sort across Unicode and across Unicode, say whether a string is bigger or uh, smaller, which should go first, then this gets really Difficult, really data intensive. This is a, a huge project. Okay, so now if we want to find out how are these methods, these 12 methods implemented, you can go to if you have the source code, or you can go in subversion and look at that or whatever. Uh, go to the file string.c and go to the very end. There's a function called init string. And this is very similar for more, many classes. There's some exceptions, but usually the class name, the file name is the same, and then at the end there's something called init something. And there, what it does is it says, well, this method called upcase, if you want this Ruby method, the, the, this is what's yet now, if you want to uh, execute that, this, uh, use this uh, corresponding C function. Okay, so let's pick out one of these. Let's take the symbol upcase one. What does this do? Here is the code. This is very simple. I wrote the equivalent in Ruby for those who uh, prefer Ruby to C. It just takes the symbol, converts it to a string, uses the string upcase, and converts it back to a symbol. Yeah. And uh, that's it. Okay, so then we have this method here that does the string up case. So let's look what, at what that does. So this is the non-destructive version, and this is still very simple, yeah? It just makes a duplicate, and then destructively up cases that. That's kind of... When you see that first, it looks a bit strange, but that's how most of the stuff is written. And that if you 
think about different ways of doing it, you find out that it's usually, it doesn't really, uh, this is kind of the way to do it. You would, from a Ruby standpoint, you would think that the uh, functional, non-destructive version is the real thing, and then this destructive one is kind of like the pariah, this is kind of the one that we usually don't want to touch and so, uh, but here it's kind of the other way around. It's kind of like, this is just some sugar top up the destructive thing. Okay, so let's look here, the destructive version. How does that look? Now we get, here we get the real uh, work starting, and I had to uh, cut this down a bit so that you actually, it actually fits on a slide. Uh, what we do here, we set flags to know what we actually, what we want to do. Because we have these 12 methods, and actually in the end, it's all done by one function. The, 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 the real actually conversion is done by one function. Uh, we check the options. We already have seen the options. We check these options. and put them into the, the flags, uh, set the, the necessary flags. Then we have some shortcuts for ASCII only, because that's a frequent case and that's what everybody expects to be uh, fast. And then we have the actual work. Well, we, ah, okay, let's look at this in detail. These are the flags. Here are the flags for, well, upcase, downcase, title case. We use these three flags for the upcase method. It's the upcase flag for the downcase method. It's the downcase flag for the capitalized method. It's the title case and upcase flag. And then after the first character, this gets changed to downcase, yeah? Uh, the first character has to be title case or upcase, and then the others have to be downcase. And for swap case, we just set both flags. So if you have a lowercase, we up we upcase it, and the uppercase we lowercase it. Yeah. So that's how we manage with three flags. Anyway, um, then the next thing is this check options. Uh, here we set more flags. Basically, for each option, there is one flag. Yeah. Then we go here to the function where this then, uh, everything goes through this string case map function. And this function, this is, uh, what this does is it handles string expansion. The problem here is when you do case conversion, the string might get a bit longer, maybe a bit shorter. Maybe it's just, it's the same number of characters, but it's more bytes. Or it's the same number of bytes, but a different number of characters. And so you have to be careful. So what we do, we have buffers, a linked list of buffers, but we try to use as few buffers as possible. We allocate one that is a little bit bigger than the original string and hope we get by. And then we use that, and when that's filled, we check how much of the original string is left, and then we say, okay, our guess that we can get by with about the same size was wrong, so let's guess that we can get by with about double the size. We hopefully have just a little bit left. So this way, this converges very quickly. Uh, I created some special case where you actually got nine buffers, but uh, that's, that was just an artificial case that never occurs. Okay, and here is the, is the actual code. It's just basically two while loops. One uh, creates and fills the buffers, and the second one then at the end just puts everything together again. And of course, if we use the OPS, we could kind of uh, save the second one. Okay, then... In here, we call this ENC case map 
function. And that's uh, pointed there because we, we actually now have to call different functions depending on the encoding. Yeah? For different encodings, we have to do different things, and that's where we are here. So this function, this function is one of the so-called encoding primitives. This is something that Matz developed. He even wrote the paper here uh, uh, about 10 years ago about this. And uh, so if this resume string here is ut an UTF-8 string, then this will call a function on enc Unicode case map in enc slash unicode.c. Uh, and that we use this function is defined here in the, the UTF-8.c file. And then the same function is used for uh, UTF-16, but this is defined in a different file. Then for Latin 1, ISO 8859 slash one. This is another function. It's just called case map because it's a static function. It's just in that file, and so we can give it the short name. OK. Uh, there was a choice whether we should do this only for UTF-8, or we should do it for more encodings. And basically, well, Matt said, well, I'm OK if it's only for UTF-8, and uh, I ask you only for all the other encodings. And I said, well, I want to see whether I can do this. And uh, I also want to get the more of a feel for how these primitives work. But my feel is mostly that it's a lot of work and that uh, uh, for less and less benefit. OK. then. There was also the choice whether to use one or more of the existing primitives or create a new primitive. And there were already three primitives related to case folding, related to, because that's what the regular expression engine uses with the slash i option. But I had a very careful look at these, and I couldn't really figure out why they worked the way they worked and so on. And so I decided better not to touch them. Yeah? So uh, we created a new primitive. Uh, and this primitive, well, it's, uh, has, this is the input and output parameters that it has. Uh, it's the most complex primitive. So it's not really, it shouldn't really be called a primitive. But there are other quite complex ones, too. OK. Now, a simple example. This is the Latin one example here. And this might be a good start if you want to create one yourself. Uh, this is, it's basically a while loop that treats one character after the other. And then you look at special cases like the German sharp S first. And then, well, if we have an uppercase and we want lowercase, then, uh, in that case, the, the calculation is easy. And then we have a special case for a few lowercase characters that are actually, in this encoding at least, don't have any uppercase equivalent. So we have to just do, do nothing here. Yeah, here is the do nothing that you can't see because it's doing nothing. Uh, and then for the if we have a lowercase character and we want uppercase, then we uh, subtract hex 20, and that's it. OK. So this is a simple example. Uh, actually, I had the idea to, well, have some of my students, second, third, fourth year uh, bachelor students, to uh, work on this, and here's the list of the who contributed what. So uh, thanks to them. Um, now, if you look at the list here, you see all these Western encodings. 
So you might wonder, so where is Shiftjis? Where is GBE, EUCKR, Big Five, all these things? Well, what we discovered that was that even for some of the Windows encodings and so, the, even the, the regular expression I option wasn't really nicely implemented. And, and for the East Asian encodings uh, too. And then at the meeting I asked, so uh, what are we going to do with these? And uh, my Japanese colleague said, well, uh, no, we don't think we need these anymore. So uh, that's the state currently. If you think you need them, you have to talk to me and maybe some others too. Uh, it's, it's not that it's not doable, but uh, uh, it, it, that's just the status now, yeah? And then let's go to the most complex primitive. That's the one that does uh, Unicode. That's the one that has really to do, deal with lots and lots of characters. It's long, it's a monster function of 140 lines. It's, again, a big while loop. And then it has to be very careful about the modified flag, because if you have a destructive version, the destructive version has to return nil if nothing changed, yeah? And, and of course, special cases, and then uh, overall, it's about 30 ifs. There's even two go-tos. There's lots of uh, bit arithmetic for flags. Uh, and then what this does, it goes and looks at some hashes that are created with GPath. And these are not new. These are actually from the regular expression en engine. So we were able to we use the data from the regular expression engine, yeah? Uh, why that? Well, this one uses case folding, which is very close to down case, yeah? So then you wonder, what about up case, yeah? You can down case, but I need to go back. And you don't want to go search through a hash, but for reasons why, that I don't know, there's actually also an unfold hash. So there's data for unfolding also, which is very close to upcase. So this is a, a few lines from that file before the changes. This just says, well, if you have a character, hex 41, which is uppercase A, then you fold that to something that is of length one and which is uh, hex 61, which is a lowercase a, yeah? And then here you, the sharp S gets folded to two small uh, 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 lowercase s's and so on. Here's a case for uh, this uh, uh, title case, and then here is Cherokee, which is special because it folds to uppercase, not to lowercase. Then what we did, well, here, you know, this, this thing here uses 21 bits of 32 bits. But this thing here, this uses two bits of 32. So we just squeezed some stuff in here, yeah? We made it very short so uh, you can still read it. We squeeze this data in, and so let's see what these F and D and so mean. Okay, so what the U means is, well, we can use this for uppercasing. If we want to uppercase, we can use this data as is. If you have a D, this means we can use it for downcase as is. If you have an F, it means we can use it for falling as is. And then, we have some special things. If we don't have the data there, we have a flag that says, uh, go to another array, and there we have some more data. It's about 420 Unicode characters only. So if we go back here, this says, 
This can be used for folding and down casing. This can be used for folding, but you, for title case or upper case, you need a special, you need special separate data and that starts at position one in that area. And then for example here for Cherokee, we can uh, use this for folding an upper case and then the unfold does the lower case. And Cherokee, the lower case Cherokee is so new that we don't have a font here yet. But if you look at these slides in five years or with a new, brand new system, maybe you see the character there. Okay, now let's just go to a very small implementation detail. Uh, let's look at these functions. Up case, I think that's useful, yeah? Down case, seems useful too. Capitalize, well, probably yes. Swap case, who has used swap case? <laughs> who has used swap case? Raise your hand. Nobody? No. Ah, was a gentleman there in the back. Okay. Okay, just in case if nobody, then, well, I used swap case, I had to test it. <laughs> okay, so that's what it is good for, yeah? Okay, why do we have swap case? Okay, well, there was a meeting and Mats was there maybe with Skype and he said, well, mm, don't really know, but maybe Python had it. Okay, so, and then I asked on the Unicode list, and then somebody, somebody came up and said, well, if you type something with caps lock on, and then you want to somehow convert it back to what you actually wanted because you didn't want to press the caps lock, then why not, yeah? Anyway, okay, so, but we implemented it. So it must be easier, upper to lower, lower to upper. Okay, but what about title case? That's these guys, yeah? Uh, I showed this one here, but a uh, few more. What do we do with this? Well, we, there's four choices, basically. Choice one is keep it as is, yeah? The people on the, from the Unicode Consortium said, don't touch this. Nobody uses it, don't touch it. Uh, otherwise, suddenly somebody comes and says, well, can you standardize this, please? Yeah, they don't want to do that. This would also perverse the ability, yeah? You can swap it and swap it back and you get back to what you had. Okay, then choice two would be up case, yeah? Choice three then is down case. Choice four is, well, this D is up case and this Z is lower case, so that's what we need, yeah? Yeah, by the way, this word says, says jungle, yeah? Jungle in Croatian. And actually, Nobu proposed this, and then, actually, I implemented it, yeah? It was a bit of work, but anyway, and I decided to commit it on April 1st, yeah? I made, uh, made sure that it was virtually all time zones covered. Draw your own conclusions. Maybe it's a, is that in, in UBC.0 we'll just kick out up case. Maybe this was a joke, maybe it wasn't. Okay. Testing. This is, I'm almost out of time, but uh, Testing, well, there's test-driven development. You just write the test and then you check and so you get a few tests with that and for this case stuff, they're actually in these two files, these kinds of tests. But then what's also important is data-driven testing, yeah? And what we actually do is we test every character, including 70,000 kanji, yeah? They don't change at all, but you have to check that they don't change, yeah? they suddenly changed here, that, that would be bad. Okay, with every encoding, well, we make sure that we eliminate the kanji for those encodings that don't have that, of course. But with all option combinations, with currently not all methods, but maybe we should do that. And the data is provided by Unicode. There are one problem here is that you actually use the same data for testing and for implementation. And ideally, two different people would implement this, but uh, 
I tried to do it, but maybe a month apart or so, so that it wouldn't be too much influence. And that stuff is here, yeah? And what we get, something like two million and something test uh, assertions, yeah? Okay. Then continuous integration has also some experience from working with uh, other committers. Uh, commit early, commit often. A good advantage here, this, uh, this year, it wasn't like this, but there was a year when suddenly said, well, we count your commits last year, and then if you have 50 commits, you get a discount, and if you have so many commits, you get a better discount. So I thought, well, better commit a bit more. Uh, anyway, and you get lots of feedback. And then there, there was one problem. I don't want to commit some errors, and suddenly somehow the make process doesn't work because it uses Ruby or so. So um, I used uh, this Lithuanian option and said, hid everything behind that, did the tests with that and so on, and, and then in the end I removed that and mostly everything worked. Okay. Uh, a few more slides about the future and then we'll be done. Okay. Character properties. Well, uh, Matt often says that, um, well, you can do everything with regular expressions. Well, for example, you have a string. This actually eats Unicode if you read all these scripts here. And you want to check, is there a hiragana in there? Then it will tell you, yeah, there's a position two, uh, position one in the Ruby counting. There is a hiragana ni, yeah? You ni code, yeah? Uh, but if you want to ask it, well, which script is this first character? There's no way to do that. Well, you can, you can write it by hand and then write all these regular expressions, check one by one, but it's uh, not very efficient, yeah? And that's something I'm currently looking at with a student, and if everything goes well, that's a big if, but maybe for Ruby 2.5, you'll have something that uses less memory, is faster, uh, provides more properties and more ways to use. But that's a big if. Okay, next, local aware formatting. This is something that, uh, well, you often have to do when you're user facing. Well, there you would say just use a library. There's quite some libraries for these kind of internationalization related things. But if you look at how you do that, Here's the example of normalization that we already implemented in Ruby itself. You see, libraries, they, the ones that do it right, they avoid monkey patching, yeah? You don't just mess with string, yeah? So it all looks kind of lengthy and not really Ruby-like, not really object-oriented, nothing, yeah? So that's kind of really a pity, yeah? Just because it's internationalization, it doesn't have to look bad, yeah? So we could actually do something like this, yeah? And we could use it for uh, mappings and so on. Uh, and then the last kind of future consideration, and that's really where we want feedback. We discovered these flaws in, in some of these encodings. And if you use more Unicode data and apply it, check it with all the encodings, you probably find more problems. And um, so, what should we do here, yeah? Matt thinks that we slowly move to almost Unicode, uh, almost UTF-8 only, but how should we do it, yeah? Should we just get rid of them for Ruby 3.0, for Ruby 4.0? What do you think? Okay, now, just to end the talk, these are acknowledgements. Um, these are the conclusions. Again, please test, yeah? Please test these new features, yeah? And then for new stuff, please tell me what you would like to see. Okay, thank you, and questions, please. <laughs>